Hello everyone, today we talk about public officials in communal Italy. We will start talking a little bit about these figures in all the European countries in this low medieval um, times. That So in fact the consolidation of mm, public uh, institutions and the, their territorial dominations and therefore the, the development also of functionaries that were ever less kind of, you know, ad hoc appointees, but actually becoming salaried professionals that are a prelude, essentially, of the permanent figures of the statesmen, let's say, of the uh, early modern um, statal model, let's say. Um, but this, this phase is very interesting because Europe had substantial differences in the forms of this development, and um, I would say that Italy makes, um, as always, kind of an exception on its own, um, especially because of the mm, substantial diversity of the systems of public offices that were created by the uh, city regimes of the center and of the north of the peninsula, where the, the communal phenomenon develops, uh, compared to especially the other European uh, powers and specifically monarchies that elsewhere in the continent were instead leading the um, this 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 changes the structurations and so here we're talking about city states right that uh, create an original institutional experience um, for which uh, the the communal civilization is, is famous in itself and naturally in this video we cannot uh, dig in the variety and the multiplicity of such uh, forms um, because every city had somewhat a different uh, history, right? But we can trace outline because in fact of the variety of the city magistracies we can't follow in detail the transformation of the single cases but we can anyhow recognize certain common characteristics uh, both relatively to the development of administrative uh, apparatuses and uh, concerning the let's say the social identity of the officials that uh, covered um, these offices. So um, th th this is a, a massive uh, mm, phenomenon, right? It has really an imposing dimension for the amount actually of of a personnel that these communes employed, the which witnesses the. The, the great, in fact, socio-economical development of communal Italy and uh, especially the strengthening of their uh, territorial domination, right? The work is expanding also outside the city, which something is you don't find basically elsewhere in Europe, so that um, we will see how we made several videos about this already, but how from the, the single city-state uh, theoretically framed into, you know, the, the empire, the feudal structure, etc., these cities will build um, essentially by themselves with, uh, without any form of legitimization at least by legitimization that came ex post in some ways by the, the public authorities they built effectively uh, what, what are called re regional states right so entire and they were centered in the cities so this is very important because when you talk about communal history you say well wh what is really this right does it stop when the seigneuries rise well, not mm, not really, right? Conventionally, yes, the seigneuries are kind of even more famous historiographically, but you have to think that uh, the construction of the late medieval Italian states passes always through the city. There is a central city, if you look at Milan, Venice, Florence, they all are, in fact, centers that do not share, you know, other... Um, poles of, of power within their, within their domains naturally always bearing in mind that these cities do not uh, eliminate the others. So still at a provincial level uh, every city remained at the head of the district of the administration but there was a, uh, essentially a centralization from the side of the powerful center over the periphery, let's call it in this way. Um, and so we, we are talking really about an a construction of an imposing system of offices that characterize the communal regimes and that eventually, in fact, uh, f overflowed the, the structure of the territorial states um, in uh, that, that uh, the communal expansion had and that therefore we can distinguish certain 
you know, aspects and fundamental moments of this transformation. So, um, and we also have to give that uh, communal Italy was had a pretty early development of this civil administration, right? Uh, you, you see this administrative apparatus around the the consular uh, co college, for example, uh, as we'll see now. We explain better what it is, and the following stabilization of specialized um, office systems. We can um, say then you can look at the adoption of forms of political government was entrusted to professional functionaries that are uh, that is better expressed by the podesta system that we also will see now then the adoption of a sort of system participation of the citizens to the public offices based on the tem temporariness of the office independently from the professional specialization this happened especially when uh, the commune was um, somewhat um, you know monopolized by certain specific families which there is a sort of from from one side a privatization of public power under uh, a lord but at the same time also a strengthening of the administrative apparatus that followed from it and then also the organization of uh, an official's apparatus that was destined to govern the territory that was uh, you know controlled by the city that could be even pretty pretty large right so the differentiation of the governmental and administrative functions depended especially on the fact that the Italian commune was born and uh, developed uh, concentrated in uh, in in the hands of this collective subject represented by the citizens those rights of public nature that were uh, through these offices fragmented in the hands of different um, uh, people individuals functionaries so this was also a way that you you can see in the communal government proper that had pr usually pretty um, the short um, mandates right the, the, these people in the city were at some point especially in the at the height of communal civilization probably obsessed about the the idea of a coup d'etat someone uh, some of, um, of of the local factions could take over as it would happen in fact with with the seigneuries and therefore was this continuous sharing right of of titles of, of functions etc so that theoretically everybody could have their own their own space naturally once again, if you go in the medieval Italy playlist, or I even I think I even created a communal um, communal Italy uh, playlist specifically to you know en enucleate better this specific uh, aspect of uh, the uh, the Italian uh, politics and institutions during the low Middle Ages, and you'll see all the you know how this happened, right? And we made several videos about the, the rise of the lordships, the creation of the so-called regional states, etc. So we'll have still to make a, an astonishing amount of of um, of videos about this because uh, we I think we we j we don't we didn't even scratch the the, the surface at this point, um, but um, so just to give you a bit of background in case you you find yourself maybe you want to deepen uh, understand what we're talking about in the first place because it's not so obvious. Mm, there is a few attention towards these topics, I think, in general, um, and um, so from from these needs was also the necessity I in the communes to operate in a multiplicity of different fields, right? And the most important being definitely justice, right? Um, and also in the management of uh, the tax uh, system, uh, right? So these were dramatically important because pacification and um, tax collection is, is you know the base of every single territorial domination. Like those are really the essentials, right? But there were other um, technical um, environments in which you know you can say for, you can see uh, from especially from a urbanistic point of view of the city as the heart of the domination, as the care for the the, the upkeeping of, of of the walls, for example and also the city planning, um, the management of infrastructures in the territory, 
also military in nature, just like the walls in the city, but uh, many other urban services. First, very importantly, the supply system, right? These cities were, especially in, in Middle Ages, we're talking about cities that were very, very large and in which the population was very concentrated. So um, we assist, especially in, in this phase of a demographic boom. Consider this time that one-fourth of the Europeans is, is Italian, right? The, the, the especially the concentration in, in the communes in central northern Italy was enormous, right? Um, and but at the same time there is a diversification also of other you know elements you know, think about the construction of cathedrals right or even art was commissioned starting being you know to from the 14th century you can talk about um, you know proto renaissance or somewhat something that um, had a continuity with further developments in the following centuries so this all this organization this uh, uh, administrative system was very old. It's something you can't find from the very beginning of the commune, right? We're talking about uh, this based apparatus of officials that um, you that dates back to the College of the Consuls, right? The Consuls were these two figures that kind of resemble ancient Rome. Uh, There's a system that uh, initially represent the first um, uh, regime of communal history. Like, these are the people who effectively create the commune with all the, the participation in large part of the citizenry, right? Um, there is a still a shared and somewhat consensual form in the way the commune was organized. And um, and the consuls were inheriting also a pre-existing administrative tradition like the one of the bishops that were, you know, previously also in within the Holy Roman Imperial uh, system in charge of the Italian cities by uh, in, fa in fact imperial imperial mandate. Um, and so we're talking about uh, an area of Europe that was the, m the most literate, actually, also the, the, the wealthiest per capita. So we're talking about um, individuals that had a solid education. Most of the cases were quite skilled in you know, administrating some of the most complex societies of the time. Um, and this, mm, uh, the, the College of the Consuls had um, enjoyed the, the support, therefore, of, of a lot of... Um, of functionaries that were entrusted with um, judicial, military, uh, organizational um, tasks, right? Also, some of the most technical, right? Uh, the, the were we see the the massari, for example, for the services of the treasury, the gastaldi for specific um, duties, and it's already a very articulated system in which. The uh, the appointees of the, for these services were considered as public officials proper, right? So it was recognized they were acting on behalf of a recognized um, uh, a public authority. That most of the cases the consular regime had seized by itself, right? Had taken from at least the bishop in some cases, and was forming right now also detached from from imperial authority, and. The development of this group of officials mm, began essentially in an empirical way, meaning that there were certain um, ad hoc mm, tasks that were um, that, that these people were entrusted with for a series of functions that uh, eventually would transform into more permanent offices, but that um, could naturally were still fluid at, at this time. There is a work that is the Breve of the Pisan consuls in uh, 1162, for example, in, um, shows the you know entails the appointment of around 30 officials among judges and other uh, appeal judges, among which um, some um, profession are present some professionals of, of law, right? Uh, the Treguari. Uh, the treasurers, uh, treasurers, the measurers, um, the con mm, controllers of uh, the of money, right? The vigilatores, right, for the organization of the urban watch, right? Uh, officials that were entrusted with the control of uh, construction or urbanistic activity, right? Th these cities are literally, you know, growing in, in spatially, right? They're, they're expanding often far beyond the 
um, the ancient Roman walls. They're incorporating the, the suburbs, etc. So there is all a, you know, city planning here that also is that needs uh, certain specific technical competences, right? And um, it, it's interesting because the consuls were in charge of the appointment. So you see that the, the functionaries were chosen chosen by the consuls among the meliores, that is essentially the, the elite of the city, um, and the title ho uh, holders of such uh, uh, offices received a salary from the commune, right? And it also swore an oath uh, relatively to the correct ex exercise of the task it was entrusted to them, uh, which configurates them es essentially as public officials right so these are professionals it's it's very interesting because you see that these functions were not just randomly um, occurring right there was a constant uh, need of such skilled personnel and uh, it was not to stop evidently because these centuries all go um, basically on on the rise in terms of the of the actual social complexity of these systems and therefore of the need of keeping them uh, well organized through this ad civil uh, administration. It's also to be observed that the specialization of the governmental functions was developed at the highest level with the uh, separation from the um, consular college of a specific organism that assumed uh, such mm, judiciary tasks, for example, um, so much that it, uh, these mm, mm, uh, colleges effectively had the, the parallel, the same uh, consular ones. Th we have even the same name, like the consules de justicia, which in Latin means the, the consuls of justice. So it's as if these were all sort of corporations that naturally emanated from the communal government but in, in some sort paralleled it also hierarchically speaking. This is easily explained also because um, such uh, uh, elite as we have seen it, like the meliores, so in Latin the, the, the best ones right, of the city, were literally the, the same people that belonged to the consular class. right? These were coming from these extended clans that ruled uh, the cities, that had their own mm, quarters, had their own extended family, right, with that at the time was, was the base of such um, city um, societies. Um, and we find these titles uh, everywhere during the 12th century in communal Italy as this organism distinguished by the um, consular magistracy of government, right? And w what is striking in this regard is that all these cities were separated one from the other, right? Of course, they were concentrated in this specific Italian region, they weren't very far from each other, but the homogeneity of such systems, especially at such an early uh, stage, um, is uh, where, where there wasn't much of a, an actual sharing of offices among the cities as it will happen later with the Podesta system um, is striking because it shows you that there was um, an awareness of what the needed models of, of administration had had to be and, and these cities with all their differences still essentially functioned in, in similar ways. Right. There is a different meaning instead that is owned by the personal, uh, let's say, the, the, the need of a stable personnel provided with specific competences for the fulfillment of certain tasks um, in the field of public education, in health, for example. So you, f you see these figures like the magistri or the ingegneri or the uh, doctors that, um, albeit being salaried by the commune, didn't um, fit into the group of m public officials strict to sensu, meaning that these were um, private professionals that the public hired uh, every once in a while to perform certain tasks. And they were actually regularly employed in, in this way too. We know, I don't know, the army had this essentially civilian 
doctors that you know performed the, their their job normally in the city and then were they were attached to to the army uh, during campaigns right and and all of these other um, specialists um, that I don't know Bill think about in the maritime republics all the um, all the technical skills the um, you know the various you know, crafts and, and tools that were required even to you know for, for shipbuilding and the necessity of adopting this uh, applicating the skills and uh, in in some other field for construction etc so naturally the system was mixed but these guys didn't fit however in the idea of the public official the idea of the uh, they were more like consulates proper right well the public official was entrusted with an actual um, authority if you want and more room for for action outside of their specific expertise um, so the social roots of the political and administrative personnel of the commune uh, as we were saying have to be um, found in the in the same um, ruling class of, of the consuls right and, um, and this was somewhat varied because uh, it contained both professionals that had made up the backbone of the administration of the former as we've uh, remember before uh, comital and episcopal um, mm, you know staffs let's call it in this way you know th in Italy the comital and episcopal uh, I mean the comital authority on the city district was assumed by the bishops largely right and sometimes the bishops were still cooperating with the commune right they weren't necessarily overthrown or simply you know they, they were appointed even in here always from from the ruling class so there were many uh, intersections um, and among these personnel we find um, I mean among the same consular class we find knights definitely but for mm, just for making you understand even what the lifestyle and the horizons of these people were um, but in the same family, extended family, could be notaries, for example, or judges that, in fact, figure prominently among some, of, you know, the the the, the elite, uh, right, the urban elite, uh, for sure. But also, and this is very important, of certain businessmen, the so-called negotiatores in Latin, that were entrusted with specific experiences of administration in accounting and finance, right? That at this time are expanding pretty damn fast Italy is on the lead of a you know accounting early banking practices now and if you look even at the military class in here you realize that they weren't just uh, warriors they weren't just knights right they they were even war in itself was actually uh, as always an economic business right all the loot for example uh, in this mm, seasonal uh, wars, uh, campaigns uh, against all th these various communes was aimed at also putting once again in circle a new wealth and the same um, milites as such were uh, in charge of redistributing re this wealth even for territorial expansion of the commune specializing uh, cultivations right so there was a very um, you know, layered uh, character of these political and social um, uh, profiles that, that is very fascinating. Um, but the, ma the major boom of the Italian communes in terms of administrative development is to be found after the peace of Constance uh, in 1183, right? So after that, the, the Lombard League has essentially won. Um, uh, its um, its autonomy uh, from Frederick Barbarossa and, and therefore the, the communes are freed largely by you know all the tax burdens that the emperor had imposed by the way also pretty pretty heavily let's remember that Frederick uh, the first of Hohenstaufen had uh, also heavily relied naturally on you know fateful um, Italian communes that had fought from inside at one point um, um, and that uh, that had uh, and, and also among the, the notaries we've, we've talked about this in the medieval law um, series I mean the, the importance in, in this specific context of the juridical studies uh, in, in central northern Italy in the juridical personnel the same emperor had drawn from these 
uh, environments to back his own <laughs> prerogatives against um, you know the, the papacy. Uh, so very complex political picture here. But the, the importance though is that after Constance, the, there is definitely eventually you know there is with Frederick II this further wave of wars in in Lombardy in in central Italy as well um, that will commit once again new resources but at the end of the 12th century there is really the the, the biggest uh, expansion that continues up to essentially for one century of the Italian communes and that r reach effectively their their height as communal institutions proper right before the rise of the seigneuries and we see in here that the cities literally like the all the military resources that had been committed against the emperor now are freed to continue what effectively they had started before Frederick had arrived, that is expanding <laughs> over, over uh, against over one another, right? So um, it, th there is this uh, full affirmation of the um, uh, communal regimes over the both the urban area, the, the consolidation at that point better, uh, but especially on the countryside, right? And this entailed all new administrative needs right that brought to the multiplication of offices as a dominant tendency in uh, in communal Italy so that in a few decades the administrative apparatus of the commune developed enormously and I stress here enormously right in relation to the realization of this complex system uh, for example of the estimates um, of the ca cadastre and of uh, also su subcontractation of the indirect taxation, um, be, uh, besides the uh, the same enhancement of the services, right? Th these were now, uh, you know, bigger and more more powerful systems. So they needed also more, you know, more resources and, and structures to to channel them. Uh, for the sake of functionality, for example, the commune of Siena uh, at in the, in the mid 13th century had uh, s several hundreds of dependents, among which we find uh, thick ranks of measurers and uh, stimatores. Right, so um, this shows the, the witnesses the capillarity of the organization of the urban market and the development of forms of um, the tax system because these um, names we have uh, listed here are essentially people who had to assess things like you know wealth, uh, land owning, um, uh, you know also there is all land surveying that you can imagine that the, the city was what it was thanks to its countryside and that's where the, the commune literally expands even militarily against the various um, you know, noble lineages here, the, the situation is complex, right, because the, the 13th century eventually is the moment in which the uh, the, the so-called people, um, which actually does, doesn't mean like the poor people, but here it's essentially the middle classes start pushing to uh, be part of the local government because they're growing dramatically rich, right, um, and, um, and the, the consular system up to that point had managed actually to as to absorb from the below a lot of people right the consular system had created the commune literally by making it participate to the government literally everyone but with the demographic expansion and the social di diversification this wasn't so true anymore right so there is this gradual um, you know polarization between the so-called grandi the, the great the magnates essentially and uh, and the people that in certain cities even manages to take over right especially in Tuscany in Lombardy didn't happen right but th there still was a tripartition in that regard um, and so you can imagine in here that uh, also the enormous administrative specialization of communal cities um, concerned both the political offices of government and the magistracies that were entrusted with the financial administration and the, manage uh, the management of urban services. So this means that there was a, a deep involvement also for, you know, for controlling pretty, pretty um, um, 
rich assets that meant a lot from in terms of who commanded who actually could dispose of this wealth and how to employ it and and this is also why the political uh, conflicts at some point get exacerbated um, there is an example from let's take Venice right um, because during the 12th and 13th century as we were saying uh, the the you know the picture is very differentiated but for example Venice in itself had um, this group of Gastaldi of the Doge right the Doge was the, the main Venetian magistracy it derived from the Latin Dux it was uh, initially a Byzantine official uh, in the Venetian lagoons and it had remained as this kind of uh, we can say monarchical but still somewhat in fact it was an, a single magistrate at a time with a naturally a college that also dealt with it, uh, with pol uh, political affairs, and um, and this group of Gastels was differentiated in several other collegial organs in turn, right? And they had to do with the silla, with the supplies of, of the city, uh, with the uh, taxes, uh, the um, uh, very importantly decentralization of the military production. Venice was um, a maritime power and depended heavily also on the control of that the state could have on the shipbuilding and the um, equipping of the ships and the military service etc uh, this entailed also the control of the mint right so Venice especially had uh, in this time a, a very um, very effective and pretty solid and and you know far-sighting idea of, of itself in terms of you know institutional um, culture and responsibility this is not true of other cities uh, also maritime type for example Genoa that would be the, the main rival of Venice in this case was much more privatized basically was not such a centralized system like in Venice and on the long run Venice uh, overran uh, ran the Ligurian rival exactly because of that because the, the the Genoa had you know had somewhat not surpassed the idea that there was a sort of shared uh, government from all these private um, families like corporations that ruled the city and um, it didn't develop anything more, more centralized but for political military sake actually that's a great minus right um, so the 13th century in itself is very interesting because it becomes really much more political in, in many ways and uh, the, the character of government in this sense assumes a certain conflictual but also more developed uh, forms right um, and there is this very special political more in fact an administrative figure um, that uh, intertwined basically with um, the orientation to substitute the consular government that was especially pushed by the people that didn't want this elite at the government anymore with the uh, entrustment of essentially to a professional politician uh, the greatest responsibilities of government right so uh, there was basically at the beginning the uh, emergency of a so-called rector um, in within the same consular college and eventually this um, choice to use for the regime a literally foreign official right the Italians uh, at this point conceived the uh, you know if you were outside if you came from outside the city you were a uh, foreigner technically um, so even if you lived, I don't know, 30 kilometers away, still was an external, right? And and this famous figure is, in fact, the the office you've probably heard of the Podesta that we mentioned before, that was recruited and salaried by the city councils. And this figure is the Podesta is very very interesting because um, th th there was um, the um, you know it acted at many levels, you know, for, from a in order to explain it beyond the institution itself you have to think that behind the, the figure of the potestad there is the the sum 
of uh, governmental experiences, of also administrative experiences from the side of the um, exponents of the ruling classes or of this so many um, cities that were uh, governed by a commune, also the, disp the um, disposability of the country aristocracy to assume certain um, offices of government or that um, were, you know, especially fitting their, I would say, their military character, right? You know, this kind of, uh, the police that becomes soon also a military commander in, in practice that, it, that overshadows even the administrative competences at some point because this is, you know, uh, war is increasing here pretty fast and also the internal internal strife so literally you know you, you needed a military commander to deal with it was a militarized government in in some way right because the the situation was pretty troubled pretty unstable a lot of s civil strifes that that had brought to the necessity actually of pacification right these guys were coming for pacifying the cities Right from w the within, especially, but also to lead the army in a kind of uh, you know, more um, less partisan way, because also the communal armies weren't like uh, statal armies. There, there was a, you know, there were yeah. Usually there were also some troops that depended on the commune, especially at this time. Certain units uh, were starting being uh, paid, you know, in a semi-permanent fashion, but still. Uh, the communal armies were a mix of all these various classes and corporations, etc. So there was a lot of politics also involved in, you know, where, where do you, where do we want to, to, to fight at one point? Because that could really uh, favor, or uh, uh, you know, disfavor certain, uh, certain groups, certain factions. So, um, and. And there were, um, especially these men, uh, these nobles from the countryside also were paradoxically same individuals that the cities feared um, to to take over. Right, this is the first appearance of the lordships uh, is is in parallel actually to the podesta office. Right, because in part the podesta was called to curb the power of certain specific uh, individuals. Other times. Um, this office was collected a bit uh, for creating a silver um, a urban, uh, you know, for uh, sort of scenery over multiple cities sometimes. From people that didn't quite have a match of a land base aside from the familial one, that, okay, there was, yeah, there were noble lineages, but nothing like in other areas of Europe because the commune had fundamentally absorb them, but at least uh, exploiting these political divisions to, to gain power for themselves. And this is in a nutshell how um, there is a coming back of, of, of these aristocrats that in part had even been expelled by the, from the cities, right, because normally these guys, even the, the urban elite were, you know, they had, you know, house towers and entire quarters even in the, uh, in the city, but their, their, the greatest man of wealth was the, was the land that they owned in, in the countryside. So that is uh, naturally um, uh, in interesting on, on the basis of which the also the, uh, the territorial domination shifts from, from the countryside to the city itself. Like controlling the city was the single most important aspect of, of the story. Um, and so th there was a great competition too. So this favored the quality of the professionals of politics that was offering to the cities a sort of inextinguishable um, pool of functionaries of government. Um, so there was the construction also of a um, sovereign local circuit of functionaries. What does it mean? Well, it means that um, the podestas were starting to come from places that were um, uh, far away um, that were shared a bit, I mean, from all the, the corners of communal Italy, right, that had naturally interests um, with ties and clientele relations with local governments, so theoretically these were to be impartial uh, figures, but they still, you know, were called because maybe they were, um, yeah, they were effectively external 
um, but they they still had some sort of um, of contact with 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 the governments that they were called to to serve in order to also and there are families that will serve for um, even for 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 decades from from the same family for generations sometimes. Um, and sometimes these people were fair, fairly humble. I mean, yeah, they were aristocrats, but at the same time, uh, you know, these aristocrats weren't sometimes as powerful as the urban elites, all right? But he knew how, especially to fight, all right? This was an important thing, because especially with the rise of the popular regimes where the the um, elites, um, the knightly elites of the city, the 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 let's say the hairs of the consular classes were progressively expelled by the city in the most radical cases um, the, uh, the 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 people basically uh, took over but it wasn't very like the people wanted to uh, just one thing to have a pacified countryside and uh, a economy going well right it was the people was actually very very violent uh, and evil in some ways you you see that they didn't care much about the negotiation they just wanted to be pacified and make money a lot of money so now uh, let's not digress but the point is that the people had a very very low uh, understanding of war right the aristocrats had instead so paradoxically it's from this period that uh, the the popular incapacity to wage arms will bring uh, once again the rise of the aristocracy and also the exploiting of the city resources to hire ever more mercenaries and to consolidate seigneurial regimes um, but uh, besides the the podesta proper that had a familia on his own right the familia in this sense is literally the the staff that followed the guy and so you th can think of about all the administrators right uh, accessory assessor judges for example experts of law notaries right these were indispensable for every city government um, also because uh, these podestas were called from places uh, that were first of all not cities usually or maybe yeah sometimes they were cities too but I mean when these guys arrived in the, in the local city they had to obey essentially the local statutes. They had to respect the local uh, laws of the commune, which were different from others. Hence, also this need of you know of a continuity, um, sometimes even um, you know f familiar one, with in the, uh, down the generations of these podestas, because they had more or less to understand how uh, specializing in. in um, f for their, you know, for their same effectiveness and value on on the market, uh, to in the local, uh, how the, the functionment of the local government, right? It was very very important, um, and it's important that the the staff of the podestas formed sort of um, professional administrative nucleus, right? That occupied both the m more specifically political offices but also the judicial ones and other technical ones so it was like an entire uh, not an entire but a sort of foreign staff foreign government right that eventually was watched all the time by the local city council um, that you know these people sometimes were even closed within the uh, public palace not to you know to find other you know not to allow uh, other citizens to to interfere with their work right to corrupt them and things like that so initially the, the thing worked right and it was this prosperous face of the podesta regimes um, later on it would be the captains of the people right especially when the people took over in certain cities and throughout all the uh, of the magnates or at least the ones that he that they they like they didn't like um, the, the people gave itself a I its own political staff right as one of the captain of the people was mostly a military figure also in here but still having you know someone some aid that gave them this 
political administrative competence, right? And these staffs had a somewhat s diverse uh, social origin, but um, it, um, it it somewhat evolved towards the multiplication of uh, the various Podesta experiences, right? There was um, a sort of standardization in the end of the of these figures. Th there, there is in here all a rhetorical culture, for example, that made up aside from the mm, mm, uh, owning of a juridical education, this essential uh, gift quality of, of the of the governor. Um, the in fact to the podestas this is very important wasn't what wasn't, wasn't quite required from the city statutes a specific juridical competence right they didn't elect these people from you know a hyper skilled lawyer they they still wanted someone somewhat charismatic um you know military capable that could make simply things work well right it couldn't be just a technical thing hence the belonging um, toward uh, uh, to the military class, right? So the the Podesta was chosen chiefly for its military capacities and his attitude to command, right? And there were freaking amount, was a freaking amount of great military commanders at the time, uh, coming from this uh, from uh, from this office. Um, also, as we've said, there was the need of rhetoric skills. Um, that is the capacity to ex uh, exercise this uh, negotiating, bargaining capacities, you know, persuading um, the, the, the parts, uh, becoming political mediators, and, um, and therefore to make things work, because effectively um, the Podesta was formed also uh, at the point in which the, the factions uh, didn't, uh, couldn't basically solve their own problems. Like, literally, cities were engulfed, right? A, a group wanted to do one thing, one uh, wanted to do the opposite, and therefore, what do we do? Let's call this foreign, um, uh, or, you know, governor, and let's him you know, deal with the thing, given that theoretically he is not into you know local politics yet, right? And therefore he he is supposed not to have particular favoritism, right? Um, naturally, as we we said, the powers of the Podesta were limited by the dispositions of the statutes and of the decisions of the council organisms. Um, they. They also were limited. He couldn't take, say, revolutionary decisions. But at the same time, he had an administration, an autonomy in the administration of justice, in political mediation, that made him uh, a true governor, mm, possessing a specific competence in the so-called science of the cities, right? Uh, how it was called at the time. That is the art of government. That was at the center of based theoretical reflection in communal culture, as it can be seen, for example, in the work of Brunetto Latini, that was also a master of Dante, who wrote um, an extensive amount uh, on... Uh, he was a polymath at the time, he went stru studying abroad in France and Spain. He collected his base, also international culture, and he use it to, to synthesize. At the time there was no... what is important in this communal culture is the development of you know, of, 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 you know, of the foundation of governmental liberties and political prerogatives of these communities that were literally developing out of, you know, of themselves, right? Um, this stuff had not emerged from from any other pre-existing tradition, the commune shaped itself by itself, and it was entrusting itself specific rights and laws um, that that were reflecting in many ways on the centrality of of you know the citizenry and um, and their 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 laws, right, their rights uh, and duties, and that are the base, in fact, of even further early modern theoretical thinking. Uh, political theory in um, in uh, you know in the Renaissance, uh, etc. So this pool of uh, functionaries in 
Podesta government had uh, initially its own center in the Lombard cities, right? Where um, the communal experience had been more precocious and, and deeper, right? Um, but it soon ex extended uh, in also in itself in 14th century, especially in central Italy that had seen a you know a, a younger but also faster rise of the communes had um, and especially had um, developed a sort of kind of more republican um, view of um, uh, you know power of institutions and the recourse to less qualified functionaries especially regarding the juridical culture of the assessor judges of the podestas corresponded uh, furthermore to the reduction of the level of autonomy and of the importance in general of the office in the frame of the gradual affirmation of the popular regimes as we have seen um, in the major cities and to this increasing political simplification um, of the um, city regimes in communal Italy, right? Um, there is at this point actually an internationalization of um, Italian political culture for which these communes were at the center literally of the whole deal of uh, the major you know the political balance uh, in, in the continent um, and but they um, uh, you know mm, as we've seen also with this uh, flaws and weaknesses that however we're seeing um, in contemporarily the construction of based territorial states that were uh, agglutinated around the, this fewer dominating cities right so that even if from the crisis the process of territorial recomposition of the communal dominions is is continuing right uh, th there are moments of crises like it's not there are setbacks depending especially on I mean, the smaller cities were were losing it, right? Uh, were 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 progressively incorporated into the uh, do dominions of the larger ones. But in fact, that's exactly the point that there was the the transformation towards a somewhat more, um, if you want, even more functional way of management. I mean, the the process of mm, political fragmentation here is inverted and even though this brought to the end of communal civilization and the rise of seigneuries well on the other hand well it, it changed something in the history of, of Europe like uh, th this can be observed also elsewhere that um, the the moment in which the, the political fragmentation occurred the most during the 13th century well it was mostly due to the proliferation of new powers but these Im immediately began to to agglutinate once again, to to aggregate, to to form more st like larger, right, and and also more stable political systems on the long run. So next to the uh, political administration, there was the rise of another uh, important group of functionaries that were um, that possessed professional competences that uh, define their role in the governmental apparatuses. We're talking about the notaries especially that were committed in those activities that required um, a, a practical type of juridical education. Right? Um, both uh, of, um, let's say, tied to that enormous writing, recording, account and activity that was connected to the administration of with politics, but also in the uh, curia of the podestas um, and in the uh, councils and the offices of the city. So private and public uh, activity at the same time. Right, notaries here, especially in Italy, are like a, an enormous amount of the population is is has a juridical education. Um, the verbalization of the council deliberations, this non-stop work of 
a revision and up, of updating of the statutes, um, statutory legislation, the uh, redaction of cadastres uh, of estimates of registration of financial accounting on the collections the loans the activities of diplomatic tra transmission of the messages towards other political entities right this is a very important moment for the development of the figure of the ambassador i, I i'm you know waging my <laughs> little crusade to to show to especially to modernists that you know the, the, the modernity wasn't born <laughs> in in the modern age, it was born in the Middle Ages, right? I, I'm citing certain sources here from the 14th century that actually state, you know, we did, did, we're calling these people that were evidently kind of, you know, messengers sometimes, but they were called ambassadors already at the time. They were surely not permanent figures, they didn't have their own uh, diplomatic seats and whatever, but, you know, by approximation, uh, it was that one. and. Initially, the political fragmentation of Italy, think of all, all these tens and tens and tens of districts that are scattered throughout all central and northern Italy, uh, favored dramatically the, uh, the diplomatic, juridical, artistical, um, economic production right this is a world that if i mean if you compare italy at this time how they were writing how they were thinking um, the volume of of sources that you 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 compare it with uh, basically the second most advanced area in europe at the time was flanders well it seems the flanders in terms of uh, that were lagging somewhat a, a century behind I, it's incredible to see the level of sophistication, of precision, of um, even of critical capacity that uh, communal Italy was producing at this time. And this is dramatically overlooked, I think, in medieval history because we attribute to still to Italy, but somewhat later on, this guiding role in Renaissance times. But if you look at the previous centuries, the communal civilization was the, the source was the key right aside from the fact that um as we were saying before the the history of the city states is often you know saying oh like italy has all these city states then yeah they were kind of something on their own we don't care but actually as we were saying before like uh, an individual city could change at this point the, the work course of um, even an imperial policy of, uh, you know, the, the Angevins of France and Naples, right? And the same Rome, right? Uh, the the papal states at this point owned communes on their own. Rome was a commune in itself. But the development, for example, of papal Angevin bureaucracy here is massive. Like, we can't say that bureaucracy is born in places like Naples, like Avignon later on. And and papal agents and armies and officials were operating throughout all Italy, same the Angevins, and there was a shared common culture that, by the way, you know, very often the city states were, in proportion, uh, you know, to their size, much more advanced actually than than even this broader monarchical systems in the sense that they, first of all, they had way more money, but at the same time they were checking their, you know political stability and uh, social stability much s more safely than than those other larger systems did naturally there were two diff completely different models right but nevertheless if you take this region uh, as a wall um, and you compare it to others in Europe it could be the size of a kingdom effectively central northern Italy uh, such you but they were all even way richer right um, altogether it, it's incredible if you look at the volume of, of, of tra traffic trade is astonishing in, in Italy this time well altogether this stuff was uh, a cultural and economical superpower right it, the only thing it lacked was political unification uh, but there is no comparison in terms as we were saying before per capita wealth of, uh, of literacy uh, of life quality in general, right? Uh, it, it, it would material culture, um, it, it's production, uh, construction, uh, artistical 
production as well. These guys were on the lead at the time. Um, so there was also uh, among these various protestant stuff the preservation of the acts of city government that required the creation of a massive apparatus of notaries, as we were saying, and scribes. It was extended to to all the offices, right? Uh, think that, for example, in half uh, in a century and a half, basically between. Um, 1250 and the end of the 14th century, the number of dependent notaries on the uh, the notaries depending on the commune of Bologna grew f from 30 up to 300, right? Especially in Tuscany, uh, I I don't remember. Like I read once that like a person out of uh, um, uh, um, um, an adult male out of four was a notary in certain areas of uh, I don't remember it was around Pistoia one of these cities in northern Tuscany I mean there were uh, entire classes that made a living of the administrative needs of the communal uh, of the communal governments so the notaries and the judges that since the beginning of the communal uh, world had um, attributed awareness and legitimacy with their technical action to the new political organization were monopolizing the fact though passing from down you know charged uh, office to office let's say the, the entire administration in its technical juridical aspects but also in the documentation uh, side of the story like so these those and entire class of professionals basically detained the control of the was the oil of communal administration right uh, without these guys it couldn't be a functional government and so lawyers in Italy had always been very present right uh, at the beginning of the communal world um, uh, the the city governments could rely on basically already on these lawyers that were carrying out uh, private activity were making those videos on the history of medieval law to show you how everything was born uh, quite spontaneously in Italy and especially Italy had this massive amount of laymen that were schooled compared to other countries so the all these economical transactions um, that Italy was the protagonist of the center of Mediterranean, shifting literally all the trade goods from you know from east to west, um, had needed the, this the presence of this figure to to emerge, right? Um, they emerged as privates, but uh, starting from the 13th century, the uh, carrying out of of, of the m of mansions for public administration was becoming prevalent for many of them. So there is a massive shift of notaries activity from private to public, right? Um, while the necessities of uh, administration in the cities and the opportunities that this offered um, made the uh, number of the, you know, um, members of professional colleges to levitate, right? So you can imagine here, you wonder why, uh, you know, the, the Bolognese school at this point was at the top juridical studies in Europe, because these guys, there was an enormous competition. I mean, it was literally like a market here. There were enormous resources that were invested in that sector. So uh, talking about thousands of people who studied law like crazy and that were even hired abroad because objectively they were the only people who had that massive consolidated juridical um, tradition of education, let's put it in this terms. Um, and there is also, uh, th this is witnessed for example by the growing importance within the same city-states of the city chancery, the heart of the governmental practice that offered, um, by the way, to the members of the notaries class the chance to extend to uh, the political functions. The monopolium was uh, exercised in the management of, office the, of the offices that were most um, strictly tied to administration. 
the role of doctoral jurists in the public offices in comparison appears to be more limited right the academic education was very long and costly by the way uh, it took lots lots of years to to become teachers I mean professors of law basically um, but at least habilitated at very authoritative offices of consonance for the public powers that were obviously more uh, remunerative um, in in actual quantity of money right because that's the point of the lesser functioning rate right and these people were like celebrities at the time uh, the lawyers the the press professors of law often even obtained knighthood like they were considered to be noble people because their education was regarded as something extremely important for society and only later on in the um, in the frame let's say of the organization of the great central tribunals of professional judges in the regional states in the very late middle ages the uh, stable framing of uh, lawyers in the um, let's say system uh, acquired uh, a you know very important um, dimension quantity there were way more people later on from professors of law that were becoming part even socially of, of this ultra elite right that held a bit everything we'll see it a bit uh, now later um, and it's been emphasized how the bureaucratic organization of the communes had r represented um, an element of strong continuity in the history of Italian public life uh, which is a difference um, that is tied to the accentuated political instability and of also of the institutional forms it would be the gradual reduction of the role of the Podesta and of his courier right his office to executive functions that corresponded to the uh, affirmation of the popular regimes in the major um, in the major communes in which the model of recruitment of the officials accentuated and uh, regulated the tendency to the distribution of offices among the citizens right so I it's you know basically the middle classes that begin to you know when they take over the uh, the the elite um, you know the offices of the older government they, they begin to share it and also especially this is happening in Tuscany where the the social classes rose like the middle classes rose faster all at once right and eventually they naturally there was a further social certification for which just the top guys usually merchants remained um, in at the top but they were, they were still a kind of a republic right there wasn't uh, a single guide uh, usually there were parentheses of scenery but at the same time the popular governments in a city like Florence that is the brightest example probably maybe even an exception to be honest but still a meaningful ex uh, example um, maintained the, this character in, in a sort of paradoxically of um, conservatorism right in the, in the sense uh, of in from this in the point of view of institutional forms because the idea was you know we still remained a kind of the democratic form of where at the beginning right it was a, a kind of an hypocrisy because that was still an oligarchic system but at least it was not monarchic like uh, the seigneuries were even though they're not, it's not maybe the best definition because still lots of other people participated maybe not lots of other people but other people uh, participated next to the senior but the chances to access of the offices multiplied for, uh, from one side the integration in the public organization of the commune um, the corporational um, or organizations in turn right uh, so that uh, the idea was that the 
the the mm, let's say the the uh, the bulk the team of experts was called from the outside now was replaced by the organization of the so-called societates and of the parts right so that it was a, a big shared um, office that eventually sclerotized and yes emarginated the weaker and and got to, to that functionality but at the same time it was the maintenance of a center of the competition um, and of interest uh, from political point of view of the mm, let's say the most important the most meaningful political and financial offices that um, that were almost always of collegial nature exactly because the the citizen feared that just one person could monopolize once again everything for example the ones that managed public debt um, that also operated the control of the city um, account right and that organized the supply system for the city the urban police so these are um, basically this key um, positions of control from which you can literally control an entire society and that's where they were what they were aiming at right it's not that these governments developed m much more of a especially this is typical of Tuscany uh, in many ways uh, that didn't quite develop for example a military um, you know you know the, the need of a permanent military character in some ways like it was mostly the idea of you know as long as we're wealthy we can repair to that just by I don't know mercenaries but for now all we want to control is the socio-economical side of the store right and we share this politically speaking by alternating the offices right but we still maintain this as long as we can and it, this naturally it was a form of civilization itself because definitely these people were especially in Florence they were uh, at the center of um, first of all Florence was the richest city in the world literally um, and uh, it had this enormous range of relations uh, with England with France like they uh, their their weapon was finance so that's how they maintain effectively you know with the if you look at the history of Florence at this point they, they were defeated basically by everybody in Tuscany but still they they remained alive so that their 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 uh, foes basically consumed themselves against these endless resources that Florence could mobilitate it doesn't ma matter if you know it got defeated uh, in open field it happened you know consistently on multiple occasions and yes Florence couldn't be taken they existed to the imperial siege um, in 12 uh, in 1312 by Henry the seventh they were defeated at the Battle of Monte Cassini three years later and then ten years later they were defeated at Alto Pasha and all tried to, to, to seize the city nobody succeeded uh, a, a constant series of military defeats at the back um, even later on in the 40s right doesn't matter <laughs> these guys eventually were to absorb right even the surrounding cities through the, their financial capacity so in the regimes that characterized between the 13th and 14th century uh, the major communal political experiences the record in systems of public officials followed the model uh, a very peculiar a fully peculiar model I would say in base to on the, the principle of participation of the citizens to public life the attribution of the office is uh, entailed uh, let's say committed the entire political society of the commune um, this was uh, true uh, both for the communes like Florence where the popular organization basically reached the identification with the commune itself right that's why it's a it's basically an exception but this is true also for cities that were instead structuring and stabilizing uh, on the base of a pretty rigid patrician regime like Venice like Venice is, is the best example of that at the, the end of the 13th century basically they shot the um, the political participation to uh, to of the people to to the parliament the, to the council so in this way and they and it was all those families but it was kind of fine because the rest of the population just made point they didn't just care that they were part of this clientele of these patricians and it was fine 
right? And and Venice went on pretty functionally and working in that sense. Uh, but even in Venice, you find that the patricians were definitely, you know, sharing in this sense the uh, the republic, right? So that they were landowners, they 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 managed important assets, they they had ships, they they trade. So they were effectively the people that made the city work. And through complex electoral procedures that so th this intertwining of cooptation, election, raffle, proportional quotas for the different components of the urban uh, ruling class, a great quantity of citizens accessed to these numerous public offices that according to a principles of rotation that um, contemplated also the um, uh, forbid the you know that forbade essentially the immediate real action kept on functioning regularly and this system intended both to grant the participation of the citizens to public life and uh, also the stabilization of powers deriving from the you know extended the prolonged exercise um, of uh, of of an office that was what was feared legitimately. And in fact, um, because if this thing would fail in the end, right? In majority of cities, right? Uh, Florence and and Venice are uh, the exception, right? In all the other cities, that's how it happens. That, but also in a less dramatic way, th as it sounds, right? But the ideal, especially the popular uh, regimes, was that uh, the offices would last, as we were saying before, you know, a very few. Like normally, a government was lasted like six months. Right or maximum, maximum one year. Uh, yet this didn't prevent, on the long run, the creation of, con uh, you know, the, the, let's say, of certain monopolies. But from an administrative point of view that we are interested in today, especially, the stabilization of conspicuous groups of functionaries within the communal regime. Right. So this didn't stop on the long run of all these events. And the crisis of the commune in the next decades wouldn't stop the, um, you know, the structuration of a public administration. This, this was true especially for the notaries of the offices that, uh, albeit you know, alternating in the offices, uh, in uh, maintain them, maintain constantly their presence in the administration and of the government. And part of the reason is that the notaries were not you know, politically competitive. These were just lawyers. They cared only about making money through law and um, that's it, right? And aggrandized their the social status by, you know, you know, had, you know, going on in this career, public career, but they didn't have, the, they weren't nobles. They didn't own major wealth, clientels, etc. So um, this is also why this figure lasts for so long because even when this, uh, when the signories rose to power, the lords didn't dismiss these guys because they, first of all they needed them, secondly they were innocuous, right? So it didn't have any. Um, there was no reason for getting rid of them. While other powers instead, I mean other offices were uh, definitely shrank in um, in signorial times. So. Around the appointment or election in the offices, um, basically revolved all the tensions of communal society in its full, um, you know, age. Right? There was this race for the offices, like Villani. That was the greatest Florentine chronicler wrote. Right? Did the, the idea that there was a strong competition around, you know, because. You can imagine that around the offices themselves, most of the times, uh, the especially the ones that we remembered above, like the control of uh, public debt, uh, city accounting, the supply system, and the urban police, Gravity did a big deal of political influence and hence of money. Um, so, hence the, the race uh, in turn. Um, so this was the moment in which the clientels, the corporations, the personal and factional relations, um, this uh, political siding and class solidarity confronted and clashed constantly. Um, it's extremely complicated to, 
to speak of, of, of this specific time because th there is a collapse, like, like there is a major paralysis sometimes of political action that uh, required uh, Iron Fist once again, hence the rise of the seniors in part, in part, but not quite. But I mean, there is a, in many ways, the failure of popular regimes uh, to to operate, right? Especially accomplice also other like economical crisis, right? In the late 13th century, Europe begins to to slow down as a system. These are the prodromes of the crisis of the early 14th century. So um, resources weren't so available, like before there, wa there wasn't a space for everyone um, at, at the top. And this is what brought for ma most of to, to fall and to remain down for a while a very other few kept in power, remained in power and extended it over uh, all around. Um, so if you look at, for example, the lists of the electable people, of the choice of, of the electors themselves, um, also in the cooptation of, of the, the members of the magistracies, um, well, you can see all this political game tied to the clientele of the city um, and that through which you can see this direct link between the personal ties in, um, interests and the exercise of the same offices right that in a certain sense becoming ineffective and empty of their original function because they don't function anymore right especially if I don't know you're in w at war with someone th th there is a political crisis nobody knows what to do you'd even have a permanent army because it costed too much and the popular government didn't want to pay for it what, what is that this communal offices uh, serve to like wh where the countryside is ravaged and uh, you even the city is running out of supplies right this is an important thing uh, nevertheless you see that from the crisis emerges the political compaction so that if, even if you look at the rise of the seigneuries you you realize it was sometimes a consensual uh, thing like the many podestas actually transformed themselves into lords that were elected as dictators that lasted you know for i don't know 10 years then the thing was prolonged to life um and um it happened in various degrees we can't see now but this as a consequence from the crisis brought not to a further you know mm, political fragmentation on the contrary uh, there is a stabilization, especially of the territorial dominions of the commune, that in the 14th century brought to this construction of a new apparatus of um, of offices that were destined to the government of the territory and of the communities that were subjected to the dominant cities. And we're talking about offices that, um, even though they weren't quite numerous after all, were definitely citing the, um, the urban ones in the attribution to the citizens so that for example the words this uh, extrinsic offices as the word called in Florence of rectors a uh, peripheral rectors that implied however very different tasks from the one of central government right These were um, the title holders of um, of, ch of offices that had to deal with this very complicated problem of the administration of the government and of the territories of the cities that uh, especially in the moment of expansion over beyond the, the, the original city district were uh, you know were quite complicated and actually also very similar to the ones that the European the other, uh, I mean the European monarchies were dealing with um, when they had to extend the affirmation of royal powers all over the territory because even though um, Italy so the rise of regional states still the local cities maintained their own institutions for example communes lived on throughout all the you know the seigneurial system like that still uh, the, the the lords hadn't basically no interest uh, at some point to uh, especially at the beginning of course to to erase the local governments I mean these were still were already standing right there was no other uh, superior uh, institution from which these um, d governments had policies had ex emerged from, right? Italy was technically a kingdom, 
but uh, there was no king <laughs> since you know uh, centuries so the, the problem is that um, you know as long as it was just a phase of expansion uh, nobody cared about uh, maybe it's not a problem but I mean the fact that they they needed simply to incorporate this communal so the, the real problem comes on the long run when uh, this dominion must be consolidated and then you find the need of centralization and especially of administrative uniformation which is a phenomenon that is typical of the 15th century in this Milan was on the fore the Milanese state um, under the Visconti and especially the Sforza um, was at the eve of the wars of Italy, the the most modern, the you know the the most functional form of government, right? At least it was the most uniform uh, and more state-like, right? If you look at Florence, for example, you always maintained this fiction for which you know there were all different cities still, but they were under Florence um, in a sort of confederacy, right? But let's say the particular peculiar form of domination exercised by the city on the countryside and on the uh, lesser or subjective communities, right, in its infinite, um, you know, differences, generate um, a model of administration in which all the competences of general character of the rector of, of the dominant city were flanked by the ancient ma uh, c council magistracies of, of, of the communes, right? And the, as well as the um, local administrative apparatuses that were protected uh, by the permanence uh, in force of the local statutes. Mm -hmm. And this is especially true in the case of, of Venice, um, in the so-called terra firma, where both the assessorial personnel of the Venetian rector and the functionaries of the structures of, of tax collection belonged to the local um, um, elite, right, uh, of, the, of the city. And in this system, th the officials of Venice had prevalently a sort of arbitral role while the political one prevailed over the technical juridical one of course with the consequent uh, let's say co uh, reflection on the professional qualification of the governors in general however after the experimentation of extraordinary offices during the military expansion the structure of the peripheral magistracies of the um, city-states follows a pattern that aside from the local differences of denomination seems to be relatively uniform, right? There is a captain or a podesta or a rector was entrusted with tasks of government of general character, justice first of all, the recruitment of the militias, the control of the external and internal enemies with a small um, company of assessorial um, uh, judges, notaries, uh, armed guards, and a functionary deputy to the finances, uh, to the um, camera uh, of the subject city. And management of, of the fortifications at this time was entrusted to a net of officials that was normally distinguished from the one of the offices of government. This is important because the, you know, the, the fortifications usually at this point were, um, you know, semi-permanent in some way and d d you you can start seeing fortifications were built for more specifically strategic uh, functions that were to stay for a longer time otherwise normally the main fortification was just uh, the local castles like every district had uh, like tens of, of castles at least like it was uh, the countryside would all dotted with this for for f forts sometimes more than else, but still effective for for the warfare of the time, and so the the city tended to detach. However, at this point where they were starting to build f fortresses here and there, the uh, in fact the military administration of these structures from the the one of the local communes that they had subjected, so that well that's pretty 
pretty obvious. Also because, telling the truth, the, the local communes didn't have much of a you know, military participation. This is the time of the rise of the mercenary companies, so the local militias are usually employed just to defend the city itself, right? And that's what you can expect from them. They're not really campaign troops. You can't go to war with them. There's been a dis... I mean, you can, but they're just subsidiary forces in some way. And at this point, the, the, the infantry has somewhat declined in importance, at least compared to cavalry. This is true, especially in Italy during the 14th century, where... Um, but it's complicated. We, we have to explain it uh, in one dedicated video at some uh, at some point. So that that's essentially the point. That the the, si the 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 dominant city had expanded all these others, and it's essentially made them pay taxes. So they preferred money over military service, and with those money, they would hire military professionals, knights, right? And and that was the the bulk of the army proper, right, in terms of actual strengths, and definitely, I mean, local militias, especially of the one of the dominant cities, weren't that bad after all, I mean, they, they could still do something effective, but still, the dominant element was this professional military force on, on horseback that this time was becoming ever, ever more specialized in, in that task. Um, so, uh, the, so you realize that the control over these communes from the dominant city was similar to the one of the foreign podesta after all, right? With the difference, however, that in this case it didn't, he didn't, um, uh, he, he wasn't uh, functionaries chosen by the community but imposed by the dominant city. That burden, however, um, especially for in terms of his salary, on the finance of the community. Right, so many people stress that basically the the cities maintained all their um, individual. They, they didn't have the perception they they were becoming part of something else of a different domination. But if you really read the sources of those times, you realize that they they perfectly perfectly realize that right, and that the fiction of the maintaining maintenance of the local communal institutions <laughs> was was just a way to say, okay, we'll leave you to the you know, the, the small local autonomy, but for the rest you're subjected to us. Naturally, this depends, because there were uh, areas of frontier that were um, usually, was not even the city to prevail, but local ar aristocrats or the rural nobility, but just for saying that the tendency was for the cities to lose ever more power, right? If these guys were, I don't know, at the time of the 12th century, active city-states on their own account and forming leagues, etc. In the 14th century you have just as few cities that eat basically everything around and they uh, they got stronger and the rest flattens uh, unavoidably. This is really important for the history of uh, not just of Italy at the time but generally speaking of how these states were structured and the impact they had also brought because they had specific political and economical cultures that, for example, didn't favor... I mean, these weren't monarchies, evidently, right? They were, yeah, the, the, the scenery resembles that, but, I mean, they, they weren't the, a monarchical state. They were still basically a, a mer mercantile republics in some form, uh, more or less inclined to war, and depending um, on which. Milan was surely the, the first in that re for, for military activity and aggressiveness and expansion. Florence was the, the, the most uh, popular in uh, not really anti-war, but, you know, sort of tight-fisted, not wanting to spend for war, having the citizen militia ideal that they were perfectly aware that it didn't, wasn't worth anything. Also because the, the local oligarchy had to work pretty well to to get rid of it <laughs> over time, given the of the middle class has g gotten out of the way of possible uh, hub evils. Um, however, that the, the fact that um, you know th there was another element that um, squeezed money from local communities is that the mm, the the official that ruled the uh, this cities from the dominant one did collect the 
money coming from the fines, from the judicial activity, right? And that was an enormous amount of, of money, a great prerogative that, that the communes had struggled hard to achieve back in the day. Think about the clash with Barbarossa was fundamentally, in, in part at least, of these prerogatives. Who is in charge here? We, we must exercise justice. It was a big deal, also for financial re reasons. Um, or the, the fact that next to the rector of the dominant city, the local administrator remained tied to the local administrative class, maintained the centrality um, of the notaries and uh, of the local notaries and judges, right? That uh, in this sense were, you know, faring well after all. That it had simply changed uh, boss, but you know, that the job was the same. Possibly in some cases, uh, well, okay, th there was a crisis even among the notaries, but at least you know some even rose in you know to higher to higher status. Um, also because they were employed in the relation between the dominant city and the uh, the local uh, ruling class, and therefore they they were potentially inserted in a circuit that was extended to an entire. Uh, regional state and open to them new opportunities for career, of education, of share all these things. So for the title holders of the peripheral offices, there was the chiefly the, the problem of the competence and of the riotousness of the exercise of the office itself. You know, um, these officials were invested generally with, you know, pretty not vague duties, but I mean, um, the, they they were normally devoid, for example, of specific juridical competences, right? They were appointed there just to maintain order, and how that they they would do it, it was their own problem. Now, so as a consequence, they also had much more opportunity to abuse of power connected with the office, uh, much more uh, than the ones that, um, for example, had the one uh, the title holders of financiary offices that instead were, you know, pretty carefully uh, framed in this regime of uh, fines to, you know, to to pay to the, uh, at the beginning of the office of, you know, of keeping track of all the, the incomes and of expenses of, of the uh, account, uh, the ex post um, uh, account and control, and of very harsh fines for those officials that would have abused of mandate, right? It could be uh, excluded by public uh, office itself that they could have quite substantial fines because naturally that was I mean th this was the philosophy of the dominant city you know I don't care how you govern this as long as you make us have the money and you tell us how much money you're actually controlling and we want to know everything right but if you you know Slaughter, you know, people who have rebel. We, we don't care. Like we just want to know about the money. This was the idea, right? It's very concrete, but also very realistic because it it tells you how effectively, you know, leveled the the local autonomy of the cities was. Um, and don't think that this is so, you know, anecdotal for the time standards because there were other areas in Europe that were struggling deeply even to curb some cities right and that it's interesting to that that would even survive within for example the monarchical systems as major i mean the thresholds of the modern age if you look at the kingdom of france for example um especially in the coastal kind of more peripheral areas from paris cities had a substantial importance they were the major reference of the crown they they negotiated with the crown Right, so they had a great power. So the Italian city states were able, if you want, in proportion to, to, to curb much more communities in that regard that had already a kind of substan also more substantially developed uh, local administration, right? And being cities themselves. So this really gives you a dimension of the capabilities and power of these polities, right? It is not to be but it, it was formed uh, in this sense without a, you know, it, it was limited, you know, geographically speaking, these this powers were, you know, contained, like they didn't, demographically speaking, for example, they didn't, 
have the means to, for example, start creating an, kind of a national army because there weren't there were just a few millions. Most of these people were involved into um, jobs that didn't leave them much room for uh, for other activity. Like you know, they, they didn't want to serve. They they had um, other other interests. They were quite conservative minded in in many ways. But this is another problem. For for now, we may it may comment it on another occasion. Um, and the control, however, on the work of the officials was exercised ex post with this system of the uh, syndicate, we can call it, that was basically um, carried out by the central organs of control, both uh, and, and also by commissions that were expressed by the same community. So in origin, uh, this was a simple accounting control on the management of the office, but gradually the syndicate uh, became a sor sort of comprehensive, um, you know, examination of, on the work of the official. Um, and the system of movement of the citizens among the various officers, however, generated a sort of class consciousness of solidarity between the officials and the controllers we can think of corruption for example and therefore um, this system I mean the first need to control these officials obviously means that they, you know it was possible for them to to abuse of their power uh, to you know to scrape off like the money the top um, but um, you know, there were certain clientels basically created a sort of, uh, um, you know, closing one eye, you know, every once in a while, so that you could share the benefits with that. Um, it depended on the political balance of the time, uh, of, of the moment, and naturally, this was a form of corruption. However, the abuse and the misappropriation, the embezzlement, in um, in actual fact, have to be separated from the trespassings of the competences and jurisdictions. This was a field um, in which uh, usually the communities, um, the local communities, and also the political magistracies of the ruling city was mm, were were involved, um, and um, they generally inclined uh, they were essentially cooperating to punish the same officials in some way because naturally they, they both lost f from the embezzlement of these figures like because the local community suffered loss of money central government too so it was a general you know possibility to to see a, you know justice being made after all um, so, as you can imagine, the the local rector from the ruling city, uh, well, was pressured uh, intensely by the local communities as much as uh, the central government. And a, you know, common characteristics of the organization of the Italian regional states was, in fact, the gradual formation of magistracies that were expressly proposed to the control of the administration apparatus. If you look, for example, at magistracies like the Avogaria, uh, the Comune in Venice, or the Otto di Guardia, and especially the Conservatory of, of, um, of the Laws in Florence, they constituted, for example, in the 15th century, this constant reference points of the government in this in the territory from the side of the officials in charge. And the emergency of such magistracies and um, you know provided with tasks of you know orientation and, and control of the exercise of government on the territory capillarly from the side of the ruling class of the um, uh, uh, ruling city was the evidence of the structuring of political and institutional systems that were fundamentally close to the ones that were developed by uh, the monarchical states 
and the profile of the governmental official was being assimilated in, from many points of view to the ones of agents of power princes and of, uh, of princes and of uh, kings in their own domains. Um, the difference is not in fact about the form. Even if you look at the military organization of these entities, you see that um, after all, the, the Italian states were pretty pretty modern, like they were pretty centralized, they were pretty functioned. The, the problem here is in part political um, short-sightedness in what was the, 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 I mean the collective interests of these states at the thresholds of the wars of Italy that didn't and couldn't probably bring to a unification of of the center and northern uh, Italy because they they were essentially looking at their own business as separated from the one of the same Italian powers. There was no real um, sense of belonging to this common you know background you know that is debatable at the time historically speaking but th there was a common like there were s certain things that are there were shared objectively you can't deny that these were areas that had their own you know mm, cultural commonality in many ways but still it hadn't passed through the original uh, originary let's say better uh, existence of a common state. No, nobody uh, in this states was thinking as you know. We all stemmed from from a of a pre-existing institutional uh, identity, right? Uh, like the Kingdom of Italy that still existed, right? They were all starting from the idea that they were either Venice, either Milan, because they had been born from that specific city and from nothing else. And this this is very important, right? Um, because it explains in part what was the underlying vision of, of these powers. Um, but in the forms, right, these powers were pretty advanced, right, so they had developed essentially the same official functions of great kingdoms as they were, f were forming, especially in Western Europe, um, but on a much smaller scale. So. Um, this reflects, in many ways, the concentration of wealth that these powers had. They were, you know, smaller than kingdoms, but still operating as kingdoms. And if if you look at their financial flow, you even understand what this practically meant. Also, because the majority of wars out there were founded um, heavily by by these powers at the same time, and, and a big deal, in fact, of the political balance, as we we're seeing before, of Europe depended on these powers as well. Um so if um we look for example at the apparatus of the offices of the ruling city, the governmental offices on the territory, the local apparatuses of the subject communes constituted complexly a an extended administrative world right uh, that was originally identified with the ci uh, citizens of the city proper in general but that was gradually differentiating right which um, did cr meet with the hostility of the citizens that were more tied to the um, kind of temporary um, the administrative office that was cr um, destined to have a, a limited serve, um, you know, existence over time, and that instead preferred uh, to dedicate themselves to private activities. This is another key of interpretation on how to explain the the failure in a leap forward towards a kind of a more extended, uh, you know, more com you know solid, um, maybe pan Italian the center northern Italian you know institutional evolution because um, the 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 mm, this oligarchs uh, yeah they wanted to have that amount of power in the city was enough to maintain their assets but at least to let them do something else right they weren't not interested in the rest they just wanted to make money on their own they didn't want to be commanders they didn't want to be 
kings, right? They didn't care. They had their money point, right? This was the normality. And this is particularly even as among the, the maritime republics, they were the ones that especially were not interested in creating not even a, a territorial domination, like Venice was forced by Milanese expansion to, to create one, but for the rest they never cared, like, and, and they were in partly right, because they were effectively risking less uh, at a, you know, in, in short and middle um, term, but uh, on the long run this thing produced uh, an incapacity to melt these um, territorial domination in something more cooperative at least. And from the end of the 14th century, in fact, you see that th there is this acknowledgement that, uh, you know, the, the, the political balance of the peninsula is, um, you know, I is impossible to break by certain standards. Also, there was a crisis that had undermined the basis of the prosperity of many families in the mercantile and business uh, environment due to the crisis of, of, of the 14th century and also the opportunity offered by the public office uh, became you know advantage, advantageous as an element of stiff of eminence and of sustitutive or at least strongly integrated profit um, with the red that's of economical activity, right? The, you, we see here the creation of a class of statual families that were basically specializing in public offices that introduced in the communal society and of this, uh, the one of the state a new and different element that was counterposed, not. Um, not uh, rarely by horizons and um, uh, interests to the you know of of the identity the original identity of the communal ruling class and and this reflects in general the crystallization of the ancien uh, let's say the creation probably of the ancien regime society which basically um, classes of status became something er er hereditary over time. This favored in fact the same structuration of regional states over the communes but it, it, it altered definitely the, the same original communal uh, organization, right? It, it was not maybe that bad <laughs> after all. The problem though is that it's as if the communal society itself and its permanence had in fact, not helped in the uh, had slowed down the process of startal structuration of these powers that was quite advanced by itself, but that met with this, um, you know, uh, hostility from the side of those who wanted a bit everything to remain as it had always been. They didn't want to invest more into more structured and dynamic powers, and they uh, somewhat created the necessity to either, you know, in, in some cases it, they brought to a general crisis, like f take Florence for example, that is most representative um, scenery of in this in this regard. I mean, what was the major consequence? It was politically and military weaker, right, compared to the other powers. Milan evo evolved towards a m uh, more like a state. Venice too, basically, even in a peculiar way. Uh, other powers naturally were there, if you look papal states, other signories that had a specifically military character, right? So that that's also interesting because certain signories like the Este in Ferrara or the uh, Gonzaga in Mantua had this kind of more, um, you know, that had less communal resistance within it. Uh, they, they were dynasties proper, of a very fairly old um and deep rooting right and they they, w they were much more entrepreneurial in the way of thinking they they risked more this is a bit way to to see that better like those who especially used the pol the military instrument were were more determined what were, were better what by themselves better um you know prepared to 
to the consolidation of political power. Uh, the Milanese lordship arrived at one step from effectively control a uh, great part, if not all, of central northern Italy at one point. But it failed. Why? Because it basically, well, th th there were dynastic problems, telling the truth, but those dynastic problems actually were amplified dramatically by the essentially the, the the communal presence on the territory on the fact that these city uh, local cities as you know more or less subjected to Milan as they could be were still especially the more distant from Milan kind of were easy to 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 come out of this scenery on their own and to uh, and and therefore obstacling the process of a statal uniformation. But anyhow, we will deal with these uh, topics on another occasion because they are actually interesting and they deserve kind of a better explanation. This one, but I, I think that you can observe what we what we we have witnessed what we're talking about here. In fact, through the same figure of the public official that had quite of a, um, you know, of a role and also exemplifies better the um, the attempts of centralization that were taking place in here, so, uh, sometimes su successfully, but still, however, dealing with certain um, political and social games involving clientele's personal interests that were in some ways curbing them, right? In, in other countries like the the, lo the official was had a much heavier power even if, if you want because it was a direct representative of the king on a, on, a, on a much longer distance and therefore with more specific and sometimes you know less compromising ways of doing so um, there are many factors have to be taken into consideration but always the one that these cities were generally not inclined to stick to um, uh, a more um, stata-like model, as we mean it as moderns, right? These were hell of states in many regards, especially for from the functionarial side, we've seen it today, the, the administrative side, but at the same time, it was the political culture that didn't allow uh, a, a greater compaction of these dominions around a better understanding of you know the, the relations between politics, society, war, and um, and seeing them as a unique part. It was a sectorialization, if you want. And generally speaking, merchants didn't like to spend money, and that that's the main problem <laughs> with it. And just for the necessary. And okay, once again, it, it doesn't have to be stereotypical here because mm, if you look at other powers, they they were struggling with with money with expenses too. Right, but at least they were starting from the the principle and the means of having of being part of a much older considered considered it from from this way. You know, if you take the Kingdom of France, it's something that existed since the the ninth century. Yeah, you you can't see it as if um, with all the previous you know monarchic or, or you know background from which it had emerged. The city states emerging in the eleventh to twelfth century. And by the end of the Middle Ages, reached a kind of a you know regional scale power. It's pretty interesting, right? When I say regional here, it means like more provincial, depending on which you know standards you take. But still, you know, there were massive power. If you take Venice or Genoa, there were massive maritime forces. Nobody had at the time, not even kingdoms. So you see here that um, the lack probably more unitary. Political and institutional culture did bring to substantial problems after all in the uh, in the formation in the consolidation of these states. But there are really many other problems, especially from military point of view. It's interesting to analyze this better because the functionality of their military systems was was dependent on this political mandate. Right, so th they they actually had pretty good military means, but they they uh, also employed them in a kind of conservative way. Once again, that 
Alright, we will see it another time. But for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.